Hello and welcome to today's program, uh, USROK Alliance, The Road Ahead. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm Tom Byrne, uh, the President and CEO of the Korea Society. Um, before we begin, I'd like to note that yesterday, uh, the Korea Society held its annual dinner at the Plaza, uh, awarding our highest honor, the Van Fleet Award, actually it's our highest and only honor, to be honest, uh, but it is high honor, uh, the Van Fleet Award to Jin Roy Yu, Chairman and CEO of Pungsan Group, and John Hamry, the President and CEO of CSIS. We also had a surprise guest speaker, the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush, who, by the way, was our Van Fleet Award recipient back in 2017. Um, we ended the evening on a high note, literally, with a mind-blowing performance by jazz musician Kenny G, um, who actually arranged for the first time a performance of Adi Dong, which was wonderful. So uh, thanks to everyone who came to that to support uh, the Korea Society. Today's program will provide an opportunity to discuss the evolving U.S. ROK alliance uh, and relationship, um, including security, diplomacy, economics, and the calibrated uh, alliance approach to North Korea, uh, global issues, and trilateral issues, namely Japan. We are delighted to be joined by three amazing speakers uh, who are unrivaled in their expertise and experience. It's my pleasure to introduce them. First, we welcome Allison Hooker. Hi, Allison. Uh, former National Security Council Senior Director for Asia. Uh, prior to that, she served as Senior Director for the Korean Peninsula, where she staffed the President for all engagements with North and South Korea, including the US DPRK summits in Singapore, Hanoi, and the DMZ. Um, she is currently a Senior Vice President at the American Global Strategy. Um, thank you for joining us, Allison. Next, we have Dr. Katrin Katz our very own uh, Van Fleet non-resident senior fellow. She currently also serves as a non-resident adjunct fellow in the office of the Korea Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, prior to that, Dr. Katz served as Director for Japan, Korea, and Oceanic Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council. So welcome back, Katrin. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, we have our very own Ambassador uh, uh, Kathleen Stevens. Um, Kathy Stevens, of course, is the board chair of the Korea Society. She's also president and CEO of the Korean Economic Institute. Uh, prior to that, she served as a U.S. ambassador to the Republic of Korea, but I think her greatest Korean credential is when she was a Peace Corps volunteer in Korea. Um, great to have you with us, Kathy. Before we get started, I want to thank uh, the Korea Foundation and our corporate sponsors for making this program possible the names and logos of which are displayed on the screen in the elevator, elevator lobby um, on the 24th floor here. Uh, the moderator for today's program is Jonathan Corrado, our Director of Policy. So I'll turn the mic over to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Tom, and thanks everybody for coming here today, watching in person and watching online, over 200 signups online and nice full room here today. So, so happy to see everybody. Uh, I'm. So excited about this panel. Uh, this is a dream panel. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this has been a big week for Korea. We saw a lot of traction, a lot of movement. Uh, President Yoon, of course, in New York for the UN General Assembly, meeting with UN Secretary General uh, Gutierrez, also having a summit with President Biden. Ambassador Stevens, we're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, in terms of trilateral relations, a much sought after, a much expected meeting with Kishida, uh, which didn't look like it was going to happen, but then it did happen. So, Katrin, I uh, look forward to talking with you about that. And then in the world of North Korea policy, uh, s struggling to find traction, right? And um, earlier this summer, the rollout of the audacious plan, and then uh, some news that the U.S. additionally sought some diplomatic engagement in July, and North Korea did not reciprocate that as well. So, Allison, looking forward to talking with you further about that. Um, to our audience members, we're going to have a time for Q&A. So at the end, remember your questions, raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. And uh, at the end of our conversation, we're going to get that over to you. And if you're watching us virtually, you could send your questions into policy at koreasociety.org. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of this moderated section. Okay, with that, Allison, over to you. So okay. North Korea policy, uh, easy. Why don't we solve it? Uh, what's going on? Um, so where we're sitting right now is it looks like we're 
as far from denuclearization as we've been in a while. Um, the audacious plan rollout has been met with kind of a muted response from North Korea and even some um, criticism from Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jung. Uh, what advice would you give uh, the White House at this juncture, given all the lessons that you've learned, how long you've spent on this profile, how many ups and downs you've been through, how many cycles you've been through. Uh, over to you, Allison, for your thoughts. Thank you. And, and first of all, I'd like to say it's a great honor to be here at the Korea Society Day today and with this panel. Um, Ambassador Stevens, Dr. Katz, longtime uh, colleagues, friends, mentors, and in many ways, in many ways. And so it's a huge honor to be here. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. So, right, I mean, you said it already. If it were easy, we would have done it decades ago. We're 25 years, almost 30 years into this process, and it feels that we're farther away than we've ever been in terms of denuclearization. There are a lot of reasons for that that I don't have to enumerate for, um, for, this, for this group, for this crowd, but particularly, I think it's important to point out that Kim is watching very carefully the war in Ukraine He's relearning the lessons his father learned about Libya. And so denuclearization doesn't seem like a smart move for him at this moment. Um, now, I've always been the optimist in, in my circle of, of colleagues when I was working on North Korea uh, in the federal government, both at the State Department and the White House. Never say never. Never give up. Um, and so I still say that in spite of what I just said. But um, it, is, it is quite difficult. And finding a way to make denuclearization attractive to Kim is, is our biggest challenge, I think. Um, and so if you're not going to make it attractive, what are your options? Uh, our options, I think, are, um, are diminishing. Uh, again, I sound really depressing, but I'll come back to optimism. Uh, diminishing in the sense that many people say sanctions don't work. Um, but there have been times in our, in our efforts where global sanctions were more effective. You had a global response to a global problem. Um, again, the, the issue today is that the globe is rightly distracted uh, by a number of more urgent challenges, COVID-19, the recovery from COVID-19, um, the economic hardships experienced through that by, by nations around the world course, the Russia-Ukraine war um, and everything that's flown from that in terms of supply chain issues and, again, economic hardships. You have China-Taiwan on the horizon. So, you know, governments are, are rightly focused on, on managing those crises or contributing to, to solutions for them. Um, however, I, I think it is worth revisiting some of these policies, the sanctions policies we have uh, worked on in the past. I'm sure they are. Uh, doing so, but reinvigorating uh, the global uh, maximum pressure campaign or global pressure campaign. I think it's worth dusting off some of those policies. Governments starting to work together, talk to one another again on what can be done in capital and around the world on those issues would be one of my uh, recommendations. Um, you know, just to put a final point on that thought, uh, it looks as though things are in a holding pattern, but I think it's quite obvious North Korea is not in a holding pattern. They've, they are, have been aiming for a moment where they could achieve uh, you know, uh, recognition as, an, as a nuclear weapons state. They are closer to that than they've ever been. But um, yes, so I, I think it, it's important that you know, we take these efforts now and, and start to re restart those conversations again around the world. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you, Thank Allison. You. And uh, opportunity here for Catherine and Ambassador Stevens. Any additional thoughts about where we sit right now with relations with North Korea? What maybe we could do going forward? Well, uh, just to, to, to add on to uh, Allison's uh, uh, initial insights, um, I think that one thing is, is important to keep in mind is that uh, Seoul and Washington need to work closely on this. Uh, we, we, we haven't had a lot of success in our, our North Korea policy, but certainly one lesson we've learned is that when Seoul and Washington are out of step, uh, it's even harder. In fact, really probably impossible. So I certainly welcome the fact that uh, there is a, a, a coordinated effort, and actually there was also a trilateral with the Japanese as well to look at particularly the, the issue of deterrence and defense. Right. 
Uh, I think uh, this week we have the USS Ronald Reagan, the aircraft carrier in Busan, for the first time an aircraft carrier uh, in in Republic of Korea waters in, in a number of years. And not to be provocative, but to send the step that uh, the, the the sign that uh, uh, again defense and deterrence will remain. Uh, crucial and we'll coordinate on that. And I also think that the South Korean public actually needs some reassurance on that point. Right. Uh, so I think that's important. But in addition, um, yeah, we have to play the long game here. Maybe we can get in a little bit later to what the negotiating approaches might be like. But uh, we have to, one, I think, accept that we are in a very different place now than we were when Alice and I worked together on the six party talks in 2005, 2006, and we could take, you know, or a few years ago. And, and, and we have to face the facts as they are now, uh, but also recognize that there are certain core elements, I think, of certainly of U.S. policy. I don't speak for the U.S. government, they won't change. President Biden uh, emphasized in his speech at the UN our commitment to the non proliferation treaty. So I would think we need to, within the context of the non proliferation treaty, think about what a diplomatic approach might look like. Uh, and think about what uh, what we can do uh, also on the humanitarian side uh, uh, to to continue to reach out, continue to try to uh, uh, see what 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 uh, openings there might be, uh, and 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 wait for opportunities and look for opportunities actively. Excellent, yeah. thank you. I guess to dovetail off of the the great comments already made here. Um, you know, silver lining, if there is one, is the degree of alignment between the U.S. and South Korea. Um, really important to remain active as North Korea doesn't respond to the initiatives of keeping the door open to diplomacy, as the UN and Biden administrations are doing, I think is very important, but not to kind of sit sit tight as that happens. And I think that's very much what's going on in terms of strengthening deterrence, uh, defense, um, conventionally extended deterrence uh, dialogue starting up again uh, last week, very important signals that are going on so that the alliance remains in a, as well as Japan as well, um, remains in a position of strength, uh, you know, no matter what North Korea does. So I think it's that kind of plan B um, that's really, you know, a, a positive here in terms of um, the Allies remaining very busy in this somewhat stagnant period. Excellent. Thank you. And polling showing that the alliance remains very popular, both in, the, in America, in Korea, really highly regarded on both sides. And um, new poll at Seoul National University, 92% of Korean respondents think that denuclearization is impossible. So what can we do in, in this case? If that's the perception out there, what can we do to make sure that we're still safe, to make sure that we're still protected, and to promote and foster conditions where we can get to a better place? So I think you all covered that really nicely. Uh, we're going to zoom out here and look at U.S.-Korea relations writ large. And Ambassador Stevens, I'll turn to you. Uh, first of all, I want to say happy birthday to you. Your birthday was yesterday. <laughs> we sang happy yesterday. birthday. <laughs> and Kenny G also played his sax to say happy birthday. That was really cool. Um, okay, so big picture look at the U.S.-Korea alliance. Right now, you've engaged as a diplomat with Korea at so many levels over so many years, beginning, as Tom mentioned, as a Peace Corps volunteer. <laughs> uh, where do you think we are right now in our relationship? Uh, a pretty mature moment. Uh, what gives you optimism and uh, what gives you pause? Are there any surprises about where we stand right now in our relationship? Well, gosh, I, I could talk a lot about that, but uh, let me. Since everyone's emphasized that I, I first went to Korea a long, long time ago, <laughs> I will. I will confess it was in 1975. And last night at the dinner, I have to say, a lot of Koreans came up to me and said, "I wasn't born when you first came to Korea." <laughs> so you are. So you take the, the the long perspective, and and from that, and of course, we're talking about the U.S. South Korea relationship. Um, I mean, it's an extraordinary story. It's an inspiring story, and it's a story about, of course, South Korea's uh, great rise economically as a democ democracy, about the maturation of a relationship. So I think my, I think I can speak for my colleagues too, and say many of us. That's why we want to continue to be involved. You know, we've seen it grow broader, deeper, more important. Uh, so it's a very positive story. Um, a couple of things. I mean, I would say one, and I know you titled the session "The Alliance," and and you know we kind of say the alliance, kind of like the Korea Society, capital T, capital A, and uh, because it, it of course has its origins and you know the the well it goes before the, even before the Korean War, but the modern alliance out of the Korean War, the the alliance forged in blood, Hyomen um, it, it We're thinking of that security alliance. I tend to talk more about the relationship. I mean, and and uh, because I think the relationship is not just a matter of rhetoric to say that it has broadened. It really has changed and is changing now. 
And again, I think we'll get more into that. But uh, yes, we have very important uh, important parts of the security relationship. We've already talked about the security challenge from North Korea, which continues and has increased, uh, but also the changing political uh, geopolitical environment in the neighborhood, to put it as succinctly, I guess, as possible. Uh, but uh, but also the changing nature of our world uh, and the fact that what we now are calling economic security issues, uh, issues like supply chain, issue like like sourcing of, of of key technologies, is so front and center. So I don't know if we call that the alliance, right. but it's 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 the relationship, yeah. uh, and it's a relationship with several different key pillars to it. So it takes a lot more attention from a lot of different sectors of our societies, both within the government and within the private sector. Uh, but we are working on these things from a basis of a relationship that, as you've already said, enjoys probably unprecedented broad support in yeah. both South Korea and the United States for the fact that we have a uh, we have this deep historic relationship. But that said, we do have different interests and different perspectives, yeah. sometimes re with relationship to the, the Korean Peninsula itself, the relationship with China, with our roles in the world. And we also have our own domestic politics in each place, which I think are presenting challenges to our policies. So I think, yes, there's room for, I mean, optimism, if you like. I mean, because we have seen, I think, a relationship that that has, with a lot of ups and downs, has steadily become, said, stronger and more important. Uh, but at the same time, we see in, in, in just the, the issues that have come up over the last couple of weeks, whether it's on you know, domestic legislation here in the United States that influences uh, massive Korean investment coming to this country, these are challenging issues that have to be reconciled and dealt with. Whether we see, as I said, the, 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 uh, uh, the geopolitical tensions vis-a-vis uh, -vis our still massive relationships with, uh, with China uh, and, uh, and, and the fact that... Uh, uh, in, in the United States and in the world, we are also looking at, at uh, a changed uh, a world in Europe, uh, which affects Korea as well and affects the relationship, the alliance. So uh, I think that we still have a long ways to go and working even more closely on that. Uh, I know when President Yoon was here this week, uh, he made a speech. He didn't go into a lot of specifics. Uh, but I think we need to get into more specifics into how we work together on these these geopolitical issues, these values issues, uh, these these existential issues on which Korea has a lot to contribute. The United States needs to play a leadership role. But as President Biden has said, we can't do it alone. We need to have able partners. And clearly, South Korea is very high on the list of those able partners if it's able to play more of that kind of role. Excellent. Okay. Opening up. No, Katrin's looking at me like, no, I don't want to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Allison? I think the only, I mean, com very comprehensive, completely agree with all of that. Um, I just add to it that I've seen, with looking at President Yoon's, uh, you know, approach to the alliance in general, the broadening out, as Ambassador Stevens said, uh, moving beyond just North Korea is the main focus of our relationship, beyond the security um, issues, it, making it deeper, broader. Uh, it really does, you know, Korea is very well placed on the global, global stage to do exactly what President Yoon is aiming to do, make it you know, a global, pivotal um, state. And I think that is, is part of the deepening relationship as well and really positive. So, yes, endorse, highly endorse everything. <laughs> Great. Maybe I'll um, put a glass half empty tinge to this <laughs> optimistic. Uh, one thing that gives me pause, I guess, um, although I do you know, fully agree with, with the assessments that, that have been offered, um, the domestic political situation in both South Korea as well as the United States, um, you know, injects quite a bit of uncertainty into the you know, future projections of how long this moment of alignment will last. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of uh, incorporated into our discussions on things like extended deterrence, which of mm -hmm. course are long-term issues um, in, in troubling ways, I think in um, you know, somewhat new ways. So even though we are um, tightening coordination and feeling this you know, um, you know, really great moment of really truly North Korea regional and global issues really closely aligned, um, President Yoon came in with a razor-thin margin, um, has very low approval ratings right now, has very li little uh, political experience. Um, and so even though, you know, I, I'm very heartened by, um, you know, personally by his, his stances on these issues, he doesn't have much room for error. Um, the opposition, of course, is in control of the National Assembly. 
Um, and so it's precarious time. The, the uh, opposition candidate um, also had a very different stance on these issues, not to say we wouldn't have worked closely with, with the other party um, in the United States. In the, in the US, of course, as, as we all know in this room, in a troubling sense, we're in a very divided time. We have um, important elections coming up, and we also have, of course, uh, potentially another administration on the horizon. So I think that all gets... Um, pulled into this, um, you know, this level of uncertainty gets pulled into this uh, precarious time, but, we, you know, with, with, with some, some reasons for optimism, but also um, mm -hmm. things that we just can't predict at the moment. Excellent. Yeah. And just to raise as an example, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act with the subsidies for electric vehicles that currently is excluding South Korean vehicles and um, there's a sense that if we're going to, Hyundai's building a huge plant in Georgia, we're going to come to America, build this huge plant. We want to be eligible for those subsidies as well. Uh, same thing with semiconductors. Uh, I see Jessica Taylor sitting right here. We just wrote a piece about chips and how we can work together, the U.S. and South Korea, on uh, semiconductor supply chain resilience. And this very quickly gets so complicated because China is a huge market that we cannot ignore. And decoupling is just impractical, <laughs> if I may be so bold to say. Uh, so what do we do? And there are a lot of cases of alignment, and then some cases where you do see some competition, and how do we manage those and find cooperation very difficult. Um, Could I just go back? I know you have, yeah. but, but I mean, I, I think Katra makes a really important point about, about the salience of the domestic political environment in both South Korea and the United States. Um, I, I just came back from a, a visit to Korea last week, and um, I... I, I, I think it's salient, but I, I, I see South Korea, I can say this now because I'm not in the U.S. government anymore, a little bit differently uh, um, in, in terms of, of how, how it plays out there. And it's in this sense. Um, you know, Koreans say as often as Americans do, our politics are so polarized, and they feel in that way in many ways they are. Um, what I see as an outsider uh, in South Korea is when it comes to issues related to the alliance and to our relationship, there is actually a lot of bipartisan uh, overlap. Um, you know, the idea of, of Korea as a global, I would now say global pivotal state, but basically, you know, every party in, in, in Korea, both in power and in the campaign, has had a similar slogan. There's broad support in, in, in South Korea for uh, a growing uh, overseas development assistance program, for example, for greater engagement in the world. There's a lot of, I mean, this is telling, you know, from glass house here, but telling another country about their politics. I don't think that South Korea needs to be as polarized as sometimes South Koreans feel they are as they present themselves on these issues related to South Korea's place in the world and how they act. There's a lot of overlap there, but I think the, the extent to which that can be nurtured um, is going to be essential to how much Korea can do. Um, and, and here, in much the same way, I think, as the Biden administration has tried to define for Americans why alliances are important, you know, why it can't be America first, and yet, and yet we have bills where our allies even are accusing it of being America first. These domestic debates are going to be very important. Yeah, absolutely. Free trade has become almost untenable at the domestic political level in the United States mm -hmm. and uh, increasingly difficult abroad as well. Um, any other thoughts on that one? Okay, let's turn over to Trilat. Uh, big development this week. Did you see that coming? Um, tell us, please, Katrin, what's going on with Korea, US, Japan relations seeming to make some progress, always still concerns about what's going to happen going forward, um, some movement. Uh, in the case, the trial, and how that affects Mitsubishi and the other Japanese companies, and just continued concern about um, will these uh, grievances and tensions continue to inhibit the security cooperation that we're hoping to see? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I have a hard time being brief on this topic because <laughs> it's been somewhat an obsession of mine since living in Japan during the uh, Kim Obuchi declaration time, which really got me interested in this topic of war apology. And then, of course, living in Korea later, um, actually went into dissertation mode on it. And so I studied a lot about the cycles of contention between Korea and Japan, which I won't go into detail about today. Um, but what's important about that, I think, is I'm always reflecting on what's similar, what's different, what's similar, what's different. Um, and so, as, as we all know in this room, we're coming out of this unpre unprecedented low, or coming out of it, hopefully, um, some positive signs. Um, 
uh, just to recap, in 2018, South Korean Supreme Court, you know, ruled and demanded that Japanese companies compensate wartime victims of forced labor, um, South Koreans. Japan said, no, you know, this was all resolved in a 1965 normalization treaty, and we gave a $500 million payment. Um, that remains Japan's um, point to this to this day. Export control and uh, economic kind of sanctions ensued, basically snowballed this historical issue into economic and security realms with um, the intelligence sharing pact getting tied up in maritime incidents. So what was unprecedented, and we're still in this mode but coming out of it, was the fact that this historical dispute bled into the entire relationship. It wasn't compartmentalized. Um, so I think what we've all been looking for is signs of change. And with the UN administration and the Biden administration, there has been um, some, some change in terms of enthusiasm for reconciliation and returning to future-oriented ties, which is always a positive sign coming out of either leader's mouth, Korea or Japan. Um, positive signs, uh, you know, summit this week, uh, you know, was it on, was it off, it happened, you know, Japan downplaying its formality, but, you know, the fact that the two leaders met uh, was certainly very positive. Um, on the trilateral front, we're seeing a lot of really positive developments. I think the driver of that is largely North Korea's weapons development and the urgency of that situation. Um, and so some real significant ramping out, you know, things we haven't seen since 2017, 2019 in terms of meetings, exercise, and, and the like. Um, so, yeah, drivers, leadership changes, um, as well as North Korea really pulling this trilat together. But but what are the sticking points? Unfortunately, it's the, the same kind of sticking point we've seen in the past. It's the historical issue. It's the forced labor issue. Um, we have um, President Boon, Boon, sorry, I don't know if he's going in and out, looking for a grand bargain. Um, I think the real problem I see is that Japan's, at least Kishida right now, doesn't really know what, you know, doesn't see much in, in it for Japan. Um, Yoon is the, you know, it's always, it's never good to be the over-enthusiastic partner in this kind of thing. There needs to be some kind of a trade going on. And, um, you know, one could envision in a, a situation, maybe like a more uncertain, unstable environment where Japan wants to kind of um, get things back in a better place. But right now, Kishida sees, I think, more costs to um, budging at all on the forced labor issue, um, while Yoon is trying very hard um, to come up with creative solutions to, so that Japanese companies do not have to actually pay. Kishida is holding firm. Um, and so that's, that's where we are. Um, some movement, I mean, positive leadership changes. Um, lessons from the past, just very quickly. Um, I do think, you know, we have seen in the past things like in 1998, a North Korean missile test push, you know, prior, prior to the Kimobuchi Declaration, push those leaders together. Japan suddenly saw a real reason to get over a really tense Dr. Takashima episode. Um, so that kind of thing today, um, you know, perhaps, you know, having a bit of Taiwan contingency, something un really, you know, unsettling in the region can open political space, shift dynamics very quickly. Um, secondly, ramping up areas of um, of uh, new engagement, economic security. You know, they're both, uh, Japan and Korea are members of RCEP, um, both members of IPEF, both, um, well, Korea wants to be in CPTPP. So these new arenas for, you know, making um, connections away from these issues. And lastly, symbolic concessions can really make a difference. Um, Things like the condolence book, you know, writing, uh, President Yoon writing in the condolence book for uh, Prime Minister Abe about we're best neighbors. These things actually cost very little. They can cost some in terms of public sentiment, you know, it can be some backlash, but often cost very little and they, they gener can generate a great deal of goodwill. Um, and so those three things, I think, would be the areas that I see as potentially, you know, helping to move things along in addition to continuing to really try to hammer out creative solutions to the forced labor issue. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I uh, wanted to mention that our next Sherman Scholar Award winner, Hun Bin Chung, who's going to present, uh, she wrote a book called Pride Not Prejudice. Uh, Katrin Katz was our inaugural Sherman Scholar Award winner. Mm. Um, and the book is about how in Northeast Asia she's conducted uh, – empirical research, identifying your national identity ended up being helpful in building trust and consensus in cooperative arrangements with uh, participants from Korea, Japan, and China. And this is, of course, so counterintuitive because we always think if we, wanna, if we want 
these kind of participants get along, we need to ignore all that stuff. We need to hide it. We need to put it away. But this research is really compelling because it suggests that that might not be the case, that acknowledging this is so essential to start to build that trust. Um, so November will be the time that you can come and watch her present her uh, work, um, opening up space now for further thoughts on trilateral uh, relations. Well, I, I mean, I would just say, I mean, I think it's important to talk about, yeah, the, and you've, uh, the bilateral relationship of Korea and Japan, and, and then, right, trilateral, then we're bringing in the United States. And I think we can always ask ourselves the question, and I don't really have the answer of, you know, when and how and if, you know, the United States sort of playing a role uh, is, is useful or not, you know, and if so, you know, how? Uh, and, and I do think the U.S. does have a role to play here, and it's tried over time. And as Catherine has said, I think there's been a lot of, you know, give you ups and downs in the relationship, but certainly a recognition, and I can speak to Korea, you know, m much more confidently than, than I can of Japan sentiment, but Japanese sentiment, that clearly, I mean, there's broad sentiment that this has to be fixed, it's gone too far. And I agree with you. I've seen, you know, the, the unit administration has made it a priority to really think what can we do. They've tried to kind of have a, a, a private bipartisan commission that would come up with something, consult and have something that would be ready. They're really trying to think of something. And they're, they're meeting, let's say, a very cool response on the Japanese side. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. I do worry if that, really, if, that, if that response remains. And I understand why it's cool in a sense that, you know, you can't trust what they're going to come up with. It's not going to stick and so on. And I don't know if the Abe assassination has influenced attitudes. But, you know, that Japan has its own dynamic. But I do worry if it, retain, if, if it continues to be kind of a cold shoulder that some of that space that I think has opened up in South Korea in terms of the political mood there might start to close again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something to continue to kind of work on. One, and this may seem like a small thing, but getting back to kind of people-to-people -people relationships are important. There's a very special and long relationship between Japan and Korea and very troubled in many ways is I've heard a lot of Koreans, and again, being there last, uh, a couple times in the last few months, really glad that uh, it looks like travel to Japan is going to open up again. Um, you know, it's Japan like has, has been really closed for to everybody for a while. And I, I, I hope that uh, not only on the business side, but on the tourism side, that that will foster and that the Japanese kind of respond to that um, a little bit more people to people ties, we can call it that. And uh, we can find some progress because I think the unit administration would really like to put this up as a, as a win. Absolutely. I think the only other uh, thing that I would add would be about the coalescing factors you mentioned. Of course, North Korea is one. I think you've mentioned China, Taiwan, but the views toward China have changed a bit, at least in the UN administration. I won't say changed a bit in Korea because it's still a very complicated issue, but UN's approach to China is different. And the you know, sort of the specter of China or the CCP, um, not just China, Taiwan, but China itself and its practices, its behavior, has been, I think, a, co a potential coalescing factor as well for the trilateral relationship. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a small bit of bright spot there as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Allison. Uh, next question is about Korea as a global pivotal state. Um, so the UN administration has broadcast that it is its foreign policy ambitions to become a global pivotal state. This means elevating its status in the region and in the world, becoming more active and multilateral, uh, doing more overseas assistance, as you were mentioning before, Ambassador Stevens. Uh, we had Ramon Pacheco Pardo come present his book, uh, Shrimp to Whale, which is kind of a repositioning of the idiom that sees Korea as a shrimp between whales and saying, no, we're more than that. And uh, there's also the refrain of Korea as a dolphin. Am I stealing that from you, Ambassador Stevens? Was that your... I think that's Shingyuk at um, uh, Stanford who came up with that. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like him. It's clever enough to be his. Um, so, yeah. So what are the opportunities? What are the obstacles? What are the challenges as Korea seeks to elevate its position to do more? You want to start? Or? You, you can start. Can I do a quick two finger on the cultural issues right after 98? a Wu Chi Kim declaration, just to reinforce what Ambassador Stevens said was the opening of cultural products in exchange. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, and that had a big impact. I was teaching students in Mokpo and, mm -hmm. you know, 
I asked them what they thought about Japan and what they knew about was manga and, and these things, you know, that was their, the, f the first thing that came to mind. So these things really, truly do matter. So I'm really sorry to <laughs> interrupt, but no, anyone point. who no, wants to jump no. in on global pivotal <laughs> state now. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I sort of, I guess, uh, preempted this a little bit by saying I, I, I do think that, and I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but, but global pivotal state is kind of the latest bumper sticker for an aspiration that Korea has long had, really, I'd take it back to No Tae Woo or, or, or Kim Young Sam. I mean, really, uh, to, to for Korea to play a bigger role in the world. Yeah. And in many ways, I think successive administrations from both parties have found it easier to kind of market both domestically and, and, and internationally. Korea playing a bigger r role on the on the international stage. And it's, Tra highly trade dependent, so there's a there's strong you know, economic motivation for this as well, than in its very troubled neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and Korea has been successful in this. I mean, you look at the fact, it's no accident that Ban Ki-moon was the UN Secretary General, that you know successive senior Korean uh, politicians and diplomats uh, go for these international positions. They don't get all of them, but and I'm not going to name all of them, but you know, you, it's, it's, that's, that's part of something that Korea has, has really tried to promote. Uh, Korea as a, a, a relatively small country, not in European terms, but in Asia terms, not in economic terms, but as a, rel as middle, as a middle power, um, gravitates towards trying to influence in multilateral fora. So this has been a longstanding thing. Um, I, I do think it's, it's very welcome that, that the unit administration draws from broad public support to try to continue that. I do think we have yet to see what we really mean by pivotal and to recognize that, particularly in the geopolitical environment we're in, there are some costs associated with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, again the the as to quote Mark Tokel, who's in the audience, uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic theater may be one theater now, to use a kind of a military term. Uh, but you know, for Korea to really play a role, let's say, on one of the key or maybe the key security question of the moment, yeah. which is Russia. Yeah. Um, that's a challenge. That's yep. a challenge for Korea. And they've done certain things. I think there's probably a hope in some parts of Washington that they would do more. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that personally, but I kind of expect that. It, it's, it's not that easy. Yep. So, so, it's, it's, so I think so far what we've seen is President Yoon, as he laid out at, at the UN, has, has taken some of the things that are relatively natural for Korea to yep. do, which is to say we're recommitting to uh, a greater ODA. Uh, we're recommitting to pr promoting uh, certain values, but I think there's, there's room to spell that out in more concrete form, whether we're talking about human rights, not only in North Korea, but elsewhere, yeah. uh, empowerment of women, yeah. uh, really how you promote democratic values in concrete ways. I do think there's a lot that Korea can do, but I think there's still a lot of fleshing out to do on that. Excellent, and just to add to that, uh, our president, Tom Byrne, uh, along with some of our staff, including Claire, Claire Callahan, is working on one of the ways that Korea is working to its strategic advantage, um, becoming a, a world vaccine hub. So one of the yeah, ways playing to its strength right. and, and trying to get out there more. Uh, he'll be presenting at KEI soon. Right. No, and, and again, and then it goes from a background of Korea having a very successful public health program in many ways. And, and But these are natural things, and I welcome them. But I think there are some other areas that have been a little more difficult for Korea to get involved in, and we still need to see, I mean, how far, you know, in, in this very difficult war environment, and uh, they take that. Right, right. Does anyone see Korea doing more than humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, which is kind of where it's been at the moment, um, to more of a military assistance? not been willing to thus far, perhaps, bridge too far. Yeah, on, I, don't, I don't see them, I mean, if we take the UNGA speech, as you know, that, that could have been a moment to announce such a thing, right? Um, I, what, I, what I thought was interesting about that speech was, uh, you know, this, this spotlight on North Korea not being mentioned, mm -hmm. right? And there was some I guess I guess we'd have to ask President Yoon himself the reason for it. There was some speculation that that was, you know, to not upset North Korea because of this proposal. But President Yoon was also very clear about wanting to move beyond North Korea, right? In his foreign affairs article, he talked about how you know we cannot remain focused. On, so that was in a in a sense, I fully agree that Korea has had this presence on the global stage, but this, you know, con concerted and intentional kind of um, attempt to be not just North Korea focused, to not be, as he says, limited, you know, by it in kind of comparison to the the Moon administration's 
um, you know, prior speeches. But um, you know, I would guess I would guess it's probably the first time that a, a South Korean president has ever spoken before the UN and not mentioned right North Korea. Right. <laughs> Right. And so, but I mean, for whatever reason, I was going back and I looked at the foreign affairs piece and he mentions, you know, we, he talked about how, you know, the prior president was obsessed like a, like in this New York mm -hmm. Times article, obsessed mm -hmm. like the only, mm -hmm. you know, ch friend in the class was North mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. um, so very much wants, you know, I, I saw it at least through that lens, like very much wants to say, no, we are defining ourselves, you know, in this global sense. But again, it needs some. Yeah. It needs some more. Um, you know, the, the, it is significant. I think in this present moment to yeah. uh, pay even just lip service to liberal international order principles, and you know, I fully, um, you know, could yeah. understand that he was doing that. But I think the challenge will be the specifics. Like, well, what does that mean for Ukraine? What does that mean for right. um, the Europe theater? How much can South Korea really do militarily when it has a major, major security, unresolved security issue right on the peninsula? And so this is, I think... Um, and you know, a desire to have a, a certain relationship with Russia is complicated. I'm just saying it's complicated. We shouldn't fool ourselves about that. And I, and I have to say, on the... North Korea is a focus in, in the past administration at the UN or elsewhere. I mean, the context, of course, was there was an American president who, in terms of the Korean Peninsula, was, I think it would be fair to say, heavily focused on North Korea. And there were things that were happening in North Korea. So it's, it's I, again, I, I guess I want to reinforce a point I was making earlier, that I do think that there's more, there's more overlap uh, with respect to policy and, and successive South Korean administrations, and sometimes they themselves, for political reasons at home, emphasize. And that sometimes, I mean, you know, we in the kind of chattering class, you know, acknowledge. Um, I, I think that any very uh, South Korean president, if there's an opportunity to pursue an opening in North Korea, that South Korean president's going to want to do that. Now, the, under different conditions, under you know, with different approaches, but this is an historic task for any Korean president. I mean, certainly to defend the Republic of Korea, but also, if at all possible, to move forward on the unfinished business of the division and the and, re, and reconciliation. So that's why you have something called the audacious proposal, mm -hmm. but then which looks a lot like previous uh, audacious proposals. And you know, I hope eventually we get some some traction on it. But I think it's just always important to kind of remind ourselves and remind others that that there is this overlap here and that I, I, I do think that President Yoon and his administration would be very prepared to move forward on, on North Korea if they saw an opportunity to make some progress. Agree completely. And I, I, on the, you know, sort of overlapping of successive administrations, I think there's incremental growth as well. I mean, it looks, you can look backwards and, and sort of say, well, this is the same, the same, the same. But if you were to go back to the beginning and look what Korea was doing, I'm talking about the on the global issues, looking what Korea was doing then compared to what it's doing now, which is mind blowing. Yeah. You know, everything from, you know, the medical field you know, on the vaccines or on technology or on overseas development assistance, et cetera. There's been so much growth. And, um, you know, I think it's worth acknowledging that. And absolutely on North Korea, anyone, any country, United States, China, South Korea, Japan, Mongolia, if there were an op opening to make some progress, then you know, I think the leadership of any country would, would take a leap at that, including South Korea. So uh, yes, um, there's plenty of room for growth, but I think there's been a lot of growth across the board. You know, on this global issue, just as you said that it reminded me, and forgive me if I, but um, again, kind of back in the day, um, you know, of, of the 60s and the 70s, I would say right up through the 80s and at, South Korea's kind of international policy, I mean, was certainly very oriented towards expanding its markets because it was, was export-oriented economic growth, but also it was in competition with North Korea. Mm. You know, so right through, and I remember again the times when I lived in Korea in the 1970s and the 1980s, um, you know, you marked it by how many countries recognized North Korea and how many recognized South Korea, right? And how many places they had embassies. I mean, under Park Jong-hee, they opened embassies in every single... This was a very poor country then, South Korea, but they opened up embassies everywhere because they didn't want North Korea to be someplace where they weren't, right? Now, we're not talking about that now. You know, the comp that competition is over. You know, what does it mean to be a successful Korean state in the 21st century? It means to be the Republic of Korea. Yeah. So they have the confidence now to say that's not what it's about. Um, so in a way, that's why you don't even have to talk about it at the UN, but it is about South Korea and the world. So, so it is a whole other context 
that we're in now, and that's happened over decades. But uh, when I when you said that, it kind of I, it was just a reminder of, to me of how how much more sophisticated it is now, how much more confident it is, and of course how much more capability South Korea has. Excellent point. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, Ambassador Stevens, we were talking about this earlier. You three are very successful women leaders in politics, security, diplomacy. Got a lot of women here who are starting their career in the middle of their career that would like your advice. What has it been like? What are the unique challenges to being a woman in this field? What has been successful for you? What have you found that works well? Uh, the challenges there, uh, I think they would really benefit from your advice. And a couple of them have even asked me prior to this. So uh, any thoughts that you might have to share on that would be really great. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I have to say, just because I didn't get to say I'm honored to be on this panel, which I am, is that these two have been an inspiration to me for a very long time. So I want to punt that to them <laughs> 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 because they have navigated. the, And I have, you know, definitely, you know, learned from the examples that were set, and pillars of wisdom and strength for many, many years. So I will just make this into a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, so, so, I mean, I, you know, I've known Alice for many years and I know that I relied on her when I uh, came back into working on Korea after 15 years of not following Korea at all and you know uh, she had standing and of course I grew to rely and respect her as so many others have because of her deep expertise I mean she was just good I mean it seems like she's just really good and better to be at what she did so that's one really basic thing so, I, I mean the other thing and since I'm the old lady here I'll say is, is for me I mean coming back into Korea it was I so I I, I I had an early assignment in Korea, and I ended up staying there for six years uh, you know, after the Peace Corps, working at the embassy there. And I, I was the first woman to serve as a political officer there. And um, I, I faced uh, the ambassador, the American ambassador there at the time, didn't want a woman as a political officer there. So, because there'd never been one. But once there was one, they realized not only could you be a woman and be a, a political officer in Korea and somehow do it, and, and my little card to get in the door was having some Korean language ability, which was not so common then. But the other thing was it actually made people in the embassy and in the State Department realize, and forgive me, you didn't have to be a white male for the Korean you know, political establishment to talk to you. You could be Asian. You could be something different. You could be you could be an Asian woman. You could be all kinds of things. So so I think once that kind of door kind of comes ajar a little bit, then it helps a lot. But then the other thing that has to I think happen is we have to help each other. And uh, I was I think I was mentioning to uh, to, to Katrin earlier. I was saying, but that um, so remembering because I I was struck too by the fact that okay we're three women and and and, and then Jonathan <laughs> like a, a sitcom or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. And. Uh, uh, there was um, a wa the Washington Post uh, uh, reporter for, in Seoul for some time, Anna Pfeiffer. I don't know if some of you may know her. She uh, a few years ago, um, uh, I was I was out at Stanford, and she she sent around an email to I guess all the women she knew on her email list, and said, uh, and she was living in Seoul at the time. She said, I'm really t tired of going to, to panels, and uh, and I, and they were all mannels. They were only men. <laughs> And uh, and whenever she would ask about uh, what, you know why aren't there any women they'd say well there's no there's no women qualified to talk about these topics so she had a, she sent around this Excel spreadsheet to just like everybody she knew and said put your name down and what topics you're prepared to talk about and so so I did and maybe you did I don't know people did <laughs> and then she kind of got it around to people and it actually kind of worked mm, yeah. it's like suddenly you know when people said well we we don't know anybody to talk to and and, and you know again that goes beyond you know, being women it's like getting outside the usual suspects. And I think yeah. one of the things about the Korea world is a very cozy place. Um, you know, people who get involved in it love it. I mean, I'm, you know, exhibit A here, you know. But you have to go beyond the usual suspects. Yeah. You have to get new voices. Uh, and that's not just a matter of gender or ethnicity or anything. It's just a matter of having good policy and perspectives. And, uh, you know, and we do have, I'm going on too long, I'm sorry. But, you know, we also have a relationship. It started with again, kind of on the military security side, which tended to be very, very heavily male-dominated. And, um, and I think it has taken a little while to kind of move out of that, but that's reflective of the relationship itself. But, uh, but now, now, I mean, I just, I'm just kind of dazzled, right? Because uh, it's, it's, uh, I think the diversity in the field is, is terrific, uh, but we don't take it for granted. Not hard at all to find a, a really excellent... Sorry, Allison, am I talking No, to no, thank you. And I mean, thank you for both of your comments. I, as I said in the beginning, it's a huge honor to be with uh, both Ambassador Stevens and, and Katrin Katz, Dr. Katz. Uh, only thing to say, 
you know, there are many people who've gone before and opened doors. I think Ambassador Stevens is one of those, certainly, you know, have broken the ceiling, ceiling um, for us that have come along behind and gone, you know, buzz, you know, kind of busted your way into an embassy when the ambassador didn't want you to be uh, a political officer. So thank you for that, for doing that hard uh, plowing work. Um, work hard is my, is my main piece of advice. You know, work will speak for you. Um, there, you will still be in, in, in situations where people don't want you there, or they might, you know, maybe not say that, of course, but, you know, they would rather it be someone else or whatever. Um, just continue to work hard, head down, uh, work hard, and, and your work will be recognized. That's my piece of advice. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> I do want to get to the audience questions. So uh, I see Jay Kim has a question here. So let's get to Jay. Thank you. Um, I'm from the Southeast, uh, U.S. Korean Chamber, I'm in Atlanta. Um, I had a quick, quick question on what it means from an economic alliance, how that's really affecting um, the dip diplomacy, how it's affecting political schemes, how it's affecting some of the, you know, the larger scale things that are happening. And one of the things I wanted to take towards is to how does that impact actual businesses all the way from small to large, the society we have an inflation pro uh, problem right now. Uh, you know, one of the scary thought for me is if I look at history, economic wars actually start real wars like the opium the China that we had, um, the, the war there. I'm just, uh, uh, hopefully we, we solve this from an economic perspective, but the more and more um, segregated we get, because interdependence really what brought peace for a long time, um, are we concerned? And what is the ways we can create better, you know, win-win situation from an economic alliance? Thanks, Jay. And I think alluding to China here, right, strategic uh, and economic competition with China affecting the U.S.-Korea relationship. Yeah, thank you. Go no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, we're really in this um, new space right right now where, you know, as you noted, interdependence really has created peace, been a real driver of peace and prosperity in the region. Um, I think, as we all know, one of the impacts of, of COVID was to understand the significance, the security significance of a number of products that are suddenly kind of coming into this bucket where we need to, you know, have different forms of protection. And what does it mean to make blocks for that? Because it's uh, fundamentally at odds with this free and open order that we are also um, you know, supporting. And so this is a contradiction. There are contradictions in all of our orders, really, truly, that's nothing new. But this is something we have to figure out. Uh, and we are figuring out, you know, unfortunately, in instances recently, somewhat clumsily, um, you know, first and foremost, you know, if we have allies that we've committed to doing these kind of blocks with, that we make sure there's something in it for them, not just, you know, a purely protectionist kind of America first approach. Um, but also, how do we maintain, you know, the principle, the core principles of um, the rules-based international order, which is by nature, you know, an open one. And I think, you know, maintaining the stance that um, something like the CPTPP can involve China, doors open to China, but there are rules. Um, how do how we're going to differentiate those spaces? Here's a block where it's going to be closed because of these security implications. Here's the trade area where it will remain open. I think we have to be pretty, I guess, frank about the contradictions um, so that there's some clarity um, that we can continue to kind of be trustworthy actors on the stage and not get accused of doing the very things that you know, um, that we don't want our rivals to do, right? So I think it's a fantastic question and it'll be one that is, you know, we're kind of watching unfold in front of our eyes. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, to, to go back a little bit in history, I think that the, the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, which was negotiated during the uh, George W. Bush and No Mu Hyun administration and then went through a couple of other administrations, you know, like 2006 and took over a decade to finally get to ratification in both countries and implementation in what, 2011, so 10 years ago. That, both that process, that decade-long process, and then the 10 years after ratification, it had a transformative effect not only so much on our, our trade, which is already pretty mature, but has grown, but in how we think about each other as partners. 
Um, and now we've come to this, this, this stage where we're, we're looking now, we're not talking about trade, at least in the United States so much, we're talking about economic security and trying to define that. Uh, and we, we've, we've gone through a, a period, and we're still kind of in it, where I'd say it's protectionist impulses are, are very strong in the United States. Um, so I think it's a challenge. You know, in Korea, you know, it's not without its anxieties about what the future holds, but Korea, as I keep saying, as a, as a trade-dependent country, economy, very large economy, in a, you know, very crowded neighborhood, um, and with China as a neighbor, you know, they don't have, if you like, the luxury of even kind of, well, I don't think the U.S. does too, but even, of even pretending that they can somehow stop trading. <laughs> Uh, so the conversation there, I think, is quite different, or that China is just going to go away, right? So, but at the same time, it has, I mean, all that has happened has meant that Korea has looked and said to the United States, how do we really deepen our economic ties with the United States? So we have, I think, just since the beginning of the year, Tom always has the figure on this, Korean companies pledging something like $25, 26000000000 billion in building plants in the United States. Now, yes, that's a vote in the importance of the alliance, the importance of the relationship. It's also, to me, I think, a little bit of indication of Korean companies are worried about what happens if the U.S. really puts up some protectionist walls, right? They need to get behind that. So I just kind of second, I think, what, what Katrin is saying is there's a lot of anxiety around this. And I think that's what you're expressing, too. Where are we going to go from here? It's why there is such sensitivity when, when a piece of legislation passes and nobody really realizes what's in it in terms of is it even consistent with the free trade agreement? Um, what is it actually going to mean for American car companies' desire to, to, to move to uh, electric vehicles? It's so complicated. Um, but again, that's where I guess I think to be that, that that's where the fact that we have a pretty mature uh, relationship of consultation um, is going to help. Uh, but, uh, but I think we're just at the beginning of this. Uh, so South Korea has joined the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum. There are four pillars. South Korea said they're in all of them. But I think South Korea is going to have to play a leading role along with the United States of actually shaping what that means, not just for our two countries, but for the other, what, 12 countries in it. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah. succinct. Um, Mako, I wanted to get to you, and I wanted to get to Mark Tokola as well. Can we start with Mark, because I saw his hand first, and then to Mako. Let's take two at one time. Yeah, thank you. Mark Tokola from KEI. Um, I'm going to cheat and ask two questions, but I'll direct <laughs> both of them to Alison Hooker. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so uh, first, how should the United States and South Korea respond to a seventh North Korean nuclear test? What do we do? And then second, if, God forbid, there was a conflict over Taiwan, what would happen on the peninsula? Would it be isolated from it or caught up in it? Great questions. OK, let's see if we could take one more from Mako as well. Hopefully, it's not also directed at Allison, because that would be a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah, fair. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Michael. Uh, the original, I, before coming here, I also served at a Japanese embassy in Seoul as a civilian defense attaché. First female, and then the great uh, Michiel. My question is simple. So, like, so South Korea and America, of course, all the because of the geographical difficult uh, difference, and also the, the the impact of any risk. Say, for example, any Russia's counter action to maybe Seoul, Seoul, Seoul or counter action, counter ac economic action from China would impact way more than what happened to the case of US got the same counter action that maybe I was wrong, but then, so my question is whether uh, the US government um, fully understand or like uh, satisfied with any action, like South Korea's action towards Russia, South Korea's attitude towards North Korea, China, or the US government, especially the Biden administration, accept more proactive um, action, especially for the security related issue, you know, against, against not necessarily against, but engagement to Russia, China, or North Korea. What's uh, the US government's kind of view to South Korea's current attitude towards this, all these national security concerns? Gotcha. Okay, so I think you're asking, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, if America acknowledges some of the vulner vulnerabilities that Korea has as we try to recruit Korea to help us in these larger geopolitical problems. 
Okay, so three questions on the table. Okay. Turn to you, Allison, first. Thank you. And Mark, thanks for those questions. It's great to see you again. Um, and it is so many friendly faces in the room uh, as well. It's great to see everyone. So on the seventh North, North Korean nuclear test, uh, what should South Korea, U.S. do? Um, great question. I think what they're do, what we're doing already is is a good start. So you have a return to uh, strengthening the military posture over the since President Yoon came in, since President Biden came in, a return to in person large scale exercises. You have uh, an increase in budget, you know, for the South Korean military. You have. Um, as you know, Ambassador Stevens mentioned, you have the U.S. carrier strike group in the region. Just taking a very strong approach, I, I, partic I continue to believe in peace through strength um, is, is an appropriate concept. Uh, and that it seems that that's what President Yoon and President Biden are doing at the moment. Now, post-test, um, UN Security Council is hamstrung on taking any new action um, because of the the war between Russia and Ukraine and no ability to pass any new um, comprehensive sanctions packages. But as I said earlier, I think implementation, I don't want to just focus on sanctions because then I, you open the can of worms on sanctions, but I'm going to briefly anyway, uh, and then move quickly to the second question. But you, the, the sanctions we have in place could be effective, again, if they were being implemented, and if you had broad, comprehensive Im implementation. And I think that just refocusing on North Korea, you know, in and in those terms would be, you know, going back to like-minded countries, going back um, and talking about what can every capital do to implement those sanctions could have, a, you know, a painful effect on North Korea, which is, you know, what we want to do. But setting that aside um, and leaving the door open for dialogue, which feels uh, pointless in that, con you know, in that context, um, strengthening the military posture is the best thing to do, which is what we're doing uh, or what they're doing. It's not we anymore. On the second question on China, Taiwan, would the peninsula be pulled in? Well, good question. Uh, you know, from the perspective of, I immediately am thinking about uh, North Korea's statement recently about not, you know, being engaged in arms transfers and directed at uh, at Russia, right? So I, I think that that North Korea would try to stay out of this um, particular potential conflict, and the UN administration has some choices to make uh, on that issue. They. President Yoon has been quite strong on Taiwan, strong, stronger on China, as you know, um, but it's complicated, as we've laid out here, and I think it might be a decision, you know, sort of a decision at a time um, to decide exactly how they would respond. Uh, I, yeah, without getting into Japan, um, you know, there would be great, I think there'd be pressure from the region and certainly from the United States um, to be involved, but it, it will be... Uh, It'll be a game time decision, I think, for President Yoon. Thanks. Um, <laughs> now, uh, on well, yeah, on, on Taiwan, I guess I'm. Uh, yes, I, I think the the uh, the South Korean government has has you know rhetorically tiptoed up to more than tiptoed up to, but I mean said things about Taiwan. In fact, I think I think in the Moon administration too, when the Moon Biden. I mean, it was kind of the first time that the word Taiwan sort of appeared in, in joint statements at the leader level. So, you know, clearly, I mean, it's understood in, in South Korea that things are shifting. And also, just in terms of general attitudes towards China, one thing that's striking to me is, is public attitudes in, in, in um, South Korea uh, towards China have become very negative, you know, again, across the board, uh, uh, from, from across the political spectrum. I th still think that the, as, as Allison uh, alludes to, the 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 scope uh, at the leader level for what you can do is still very narrow because it's such a complicated and delicate relationship that that and that the South Korea tries to balance with uh, uh, balance is not a good word, but but anymore, but uh, with with China, um, uh, it it does recall the in 2006 2007 Secretary Rumsfeld at that time the Nomi Hun government yeah you know, there was a big negotiation with something uh, over something called strategic flexibility. 
uh, with the South Koreans at that time, feeling very strongly that it had to be clear that U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula were only there to defend against North Korea. After a lot, and, and at this time, of course, the Iraq War, and of course, Korea sent its own troops to, to Iraq, but the forces on the peninsula at that time, the Department of Defense, the U.S. felt, should be ready to go where they were needed most and not tied down to the peninsula. Finally, there was language, much negotiated and, 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 and finally agreed, that uh, this was subject to the will of the Korean people. So if, if tensions increased in Taiwan, I think you would hear talk about this again. Mm -hmm. How would the will of the Korean people be expressed on this? Yeah. And it could become a huge issue. Even before that, I do think that kind of Taiwan is a little bit now kind of those litmus tests, right? Mm -hmm. How far is, is South Korea willing to go in terms of what it says? And, uh, and then, of course, you have on top of that the, the kind of complicated relationship uh, between Taiwan and South Korea with respect to economic security and, and, and a competitive relationship as well and microchips and you know, semiconductors and the rest of it. Um, uh, to your, to your uh, comment on, on does, the, you know, does the U.S. government understand, I'm sure the government, U.S. government would say they do understand uh, what a difficult uh, position uh, Korea finds itself in. And I think you'd find in Seoul that a lot of Koreans feel like they don't understand enough. Uh, I mean, what I've heard over, uh, certainly since the, the, the THAAD uh, 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 retaliation or the retaliation by China against South Korea with respect to the deployment of the uh, missile defense, the THAAD battery in South Korea, was if this ever happens again, are you on our side? And let's make some arrangements now to show that we're going to kind of share the, share the risk, share the cost if something like this happens again. Um, I don't think there's been any particular movement towards doing that, but uh, I think there's, there remains worry in Seoul about whether or not this understanding extends to you know, doing something that would actually help mitigate uh, the risk that Seoul feels it faces vis-a-vis -vis China. And Russia, I, I don't know, I've thought a little bit less about, except I, I think, you know, uh, again, whether it's the UN administration or another administration, I mean, you know, Russia, you know, was an important player on the Korean Peninsula, right, uh, uh, a century ago. Um, it still is important to whatever future of the whole Korean Peninsula exists. It's an important energy slash uh, uh, economic uh, potential partner and, and uh, for South Korea. So they're a little nervous. They're a little nervous about what they do. I think they're trying to balance some of their commercial and economic interests with their, you know, their geopolitical desire to play this pivotal state. So it's a, it's a hard choice for them, and I, I think they just they don't want to make it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did some uh, research on this very point you mentioned, Thad, before, and Korean concerns about potential blowback from China. And Katrin participated in the survey that I conducted with 15 Americans and 15 South Koreans, and I said, "Do you think it's important for America to signal?" before anything happens, that we will help out Korea in the case that they are subject to additional sanctions of helping the affected industries, reciprocal sanctions, what have you. Uh, Americans were much less likely to say yes to that question. And then I asked, should this assurance be private or public? Koreans more more likely wanted it to be public. Let let it be known. And Americans wanted it to be private. Uh, so again, some, you know, just calibration to do in terms of this Im important defense battery that, that we have to shore up. Um, Katrin, I think I was on the public side, actually. I think. <laughs> well, maybe an okay. outlier. I mean, because to, it would, to have the deterrent effect, I guess, if you wanted to have some sort of deterrent effect and you do it privately, it won't really, you know, right. if you want to stop it from happening again and show. I think there was there's something to be said for showing that we won't wouldn't leave South Korea, you know, hanging like in 2017. So that's, that was my rationale for maybe being the outlier there. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the Taiwan contingency, I just think, uh, you know, uh, quiet conversations in the trilateral space mm -hmm. to have clarity. What, yeah. what, I mean, we getting close to these scenarios, you know, with the Pelosi visit and the uptick and kind of new normal or, and, you know, the implications that had immediately for Japan. Well, what does that mean for U.S. forces in Japan that are also critical to the defense of South Korea? These are really important discussions, but sensitive discussions to have. But um, the trilateral, like, uh, kind of arena opening up again, hopefully uh, can be a space for those, you know, contingency discussions just to kind of have that clarity uh, for, for any number of scenarios. So unfortunately, that is our time. Uh, we went even over. Uh, that just went really, really fast. Um, please help me to thank all of our wonderful panelists who came and spoke today.
Thank you, our audience, for joining us. We have lunch in the kitchen for you, so please help yourself. We got some delicious dumplings, so please hang out, spend some time with us, and check back on our website. October 6th, we're coming back with a program called Broadcasting to North Korea with the head of VOA's Korean service, Dong Hyuk Lee and Ji Yoon Baek at Harvard University. Um, we're going to have another program on Korean Peninsula nuclear update on October 25th, and that one's going to be in person as well. So come join us early and often. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye. Thank you.